Here now is H.M.S. Richards, the voice of prophecy speaker. His subject, the exalted angel. A small boy came running into his mother, shouting, Mother, I'm as tall as Goliath. I'm nine feet high. What makes you say that, asked a surprised mother. Well, I've made myself a little ruler of my own. I measured myself with it, and I'm just nine feet tall. The Holy Scripture speaks of people like that boy. They follow his method. They measure themselves by their own rulers, by their own personal yardsticks. The Apostle Paul speaks of such people as measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves. He says that they are not wise. You'll read that in 2 Corinthians 10, verse 12. Ungodly pride has been a curse to millions. Sometimes exaltation of position is forced on Christians. Sometimes it's assumed. Both experiences came to the Christians who lived during the period of which we speak today, the third or Pergamus period of the history of the church. Listen now to Christ's letter to the exalted angel, the word angel standing for the ministry of the church during that period. We shall consider it verse by verse. Revelation 2.12 is the first verse. And to the angel of the church in Pergamus write, These things saith he which hath a sharp sword with two edges. The word Pergamus means height or elevation. The city of Pergamus in Asia Minor was situated on a great rock at least a thousand feet high. It was never taken except by stratagem. It was considered the safest place in the kingdom, and here the king deposited all his riches. It was the location of the supreme court of the country, and the Roman consuls, who later had authority in Asia, had their headquarters here. Their symbol was the sharp, two-edged Roman sword, the famous cutting and stabbing sword. With its two edges, it was the symbol of the authority of life and death. This period of the church begins at the time when Emperor Constantine professed Christianity and united church and state, thus greatly exalting the formerly persecuted Christian faith. The Roman government, which had previously tried to stamp out Christianity, now supported it. It became popular to be a Christian. The church then became political, and in doing that lost much of its spirituality, of course. In every age of the world, a political church has been an unspiritual church. The union of church and state is specifically forbidden in the Constitution of the United States and also in the constitutions and customs of some other countries. State support of the church has always meant more or less state control and the temptation to receive support from the government, while great in many instances has almost without exception become a curse to the church itself. And so it was during this period of two or three hundred years when it was popular and legal in the Roman Empire to become a Christian. The exaltation did not prove to be an unmixed blessing. But in spite of it all, there were many faithful children of God in this period. The divine writer continues, I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is, and thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. Pergamus had become the headquarters of pagan religion. When Cyrus the Persian captured the great city of Babylon, the Pontifex Maximus, or high priest of the pagan idolatry in Babylon, fled with all his attendants carrying some of the Babylonian symbols of worship to Pergamos. And there they set up the Babylonian worship. Later on it was transferred to the city of Rome, when Attalus, the last priest king, died, having willed his kingdom and authority to the Roman Republic. But right in the very headquarters of Satan's worship, God had his faithful children who held fast the name of Christ. They didn't deny the faith, even when Antipas, the faithful martyr, was put to death. The report is that he was placed inside a gigantic brass bull, which was slowly heated until it was red hot. So to the very end, this martyr of Christ praised God and was faithful even unto death. 
But soon prosperity did to the church what persecution could not do. So the letter to the exalted angel continues, verse 14 of Revelation 2. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel. In the 15th verse, the same thing is said about the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. These are the words of Christ to the exalted angel. The history of the false prophet Balaam is found in your Bible in the Old Testament. It numbers the 24th chapter. It shows that for money he was willing to sell out the truth as he knew it. Balaam is represented as the prototype of all false teachers. He is symbolic of compromise with the world. His religion of wealth and honor would make the church of God a house of merchandise. He was willing to curse the people of God, whom he knew to be the people of God, for a certain price, if it was high enough. And so it was during this period that the church began to compromise with the world as never before. Slowly but surely, false doctrines came along with false practices, and the purity of apostolic times was largely lost. Rites and ceremonies took the place of purity of life and faithfulness in doctrine. Then the Savior writes these warning words, verse 16, Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against thee with the word of my mouth. Just as the angel of old opposed Balaam with a drawn sword, you remember, so here we notice that unique phrase, the sword of my mouth. Christ's words are like swords against sin. Did not the apostle say, For the word of God is quick or living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart? That's Hebrews 4.12. The word of God then is like a sword. It pierces the conscience of man. It is with the sword of Christ's word that apostasy and sin are to be eradicated from the human life, not by the sword of the state. And notice Jesus doesn't say to the whole church, I will fight against you, but I will fight against them, that is, the sinners in this Pergamos period, the guilty ones, and that's true today in every age. God does not warn the entire church for something they're not guilty of, but those who are guilty. Or else... These words imply that if the angel of the church, the ministry of that church, the preachers, those that give the word, those who are responsible, failed, the supreme head of the church would visit the apostates with sure judgment. It's the duty of every true pastor today to point out sin and to labor with sinners, to reprove them in love but with earnestness. Apostates and open sinners should be either converted or separated from the communion of the church. Basking in the light of imperial patronage, preachers back there were tempted to preach smooth things. Daniel Webster, the famous American politician, statesman, orator, once spent a summer in New Hampshire, and every time possible went to a little country church morning and evening. One day his niece asked him why he went to hear this country pastor when far abler preachers in Washington were disregarded by him. He replied, in Washington, they preached to Daniel Webster, the statesman. This man has been telling Daniel Webster, the sinner of Jesus of Nazareth. That's the sort of preaching that was needed in the days of the exalted angel. It's needed now. To the Christians living in those dangerous times and to us comes the message of the Lord of final promise. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Notice, to all the churches, not merely to one, but to the church of that day and the church of this day. The messages apply to all of us. If we hear, we shall be blessed. And here is how, the last verse, To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. Revelation 2.17 Those who have read the Old Testament will remember that a pot of manna was placed in the Ark of the Covenant 
in the most holy place of the earthly temple, a pledge of all that God would do for his people, that they would be fed when they were obedient to him. This pot of manna was called the hidden manna because no man saw it but the high priest when he went into the most holy place. Jesus is the real manna, the real bread of life, as we read in John the sixth chapter. Those who feed him upon him, the living bread, have eternal life. And it is written in the Bible, Thy word have I hid in mine heart, that I might not sin against thee. Psalms 119, 11. It is believed by the people of Israel that just before Jerusalem was captured by the Babylonians, the ark of God with all its contents, including this pot of manna, was taken by the prophet Jeremiah and hidden in a secret cave in Mount Nebo and has never been seen to this day. But what about the white stone, which is promised to every believer? Remember the custom of ancient judges in using white and black stones or pebbles in making their decisions? White stone, righteousness and acquittal, black stone, guilt, condemnation. And often new names were given to slaves when they were freed. They were given white stone to show that they were free men with their name inscribed on it. These stones were badges of friendship. If a gladiator won 15 successive victories, he was given a white stone, the symbol of his freedom. So the name on the white stone in this text must represent not only freedom but victory. A man is an overcomer. We have been slaves of sin. We are to be free in Christ. Jesus said, If the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. John 8, 36. It is by this new name, this heavenly name, this name which unites us with the family of God that we are made heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Romans seven thirty one. So, friends, we must not only have this new name, this name of experience, this name as a child of God, but we must also feed on the hidden manna, the Word of God, and it must be hidden in our hearts. Remember, these great promises are for us, as well as for the exalted angel, the ministry of the Church of Pergamos. They are for us who live in the 20th century and face the same problems. The white stone, the new name, the hidden manna, they are all ours. Will you, friend, give your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ today? Will you follow him with all faithfulness, as did many of those who lived away back there in the days of the exalted angel?